Chapter 13 A Malevolent Conspiracy Frederick Antry Weston was then summoned before the court. Straight-backed, stiff-necked, and as superbly turned out as befitted the master-at-arms of one of His Majesty's flagships, and the disciplinary lord and master of the lower deck of Royal Oak. He gave it as his opinion that the general conduct of the ship's company was average by Royal Navy standards, though he agreed in cross-examination that he had heard rumours on the mess deck that the admiral had told the captain that he was no more used to him than a bloody midshipman. That, he felt, had done nothing for the captain standing among the crew, and that too closed the case for the prosecution. Captain Dewar asked Kimball to make the opening speech for the defence, and, bewigged and gowned, the American-born lawyer, who had little or nothing to do all that day, made the most of his opportunity. As usual, he addressed the court at considerable length. The court in return, starch-collared, frock-coated, gilded and burdened with a shoulder bullion, fiddled with its white gloves and swords and made every effort to concentrate. Put simply, Kimball's case was that Dewar was being tried because he had forwarded Commander Daniel's letter. There was no suggestion that his own covering letter was at fault. But, as it contained many of the points that Daniel had made, then surely Daniel's letter was also justified. The commander had been asked to write the letter in the first place. True. He had added several paragraphs of his own volition, but they were intended for the good of the welfare and discipline of the ship. Dewar had accepted the letter after being certain in his own mind that Daniel had given its composition serious thought and had no alternative but to forward it. He was in no way intended to be a censor. Dewar then gave evidence himself. He said that he had no personal feeling in writing his own letter of complaint about Collard. In fact, he realised that making a personal report like that on a superior was not likely to do him any good. He did not make a personal protest to Collard himself because I considered then and I consider now that if I went with a protest of that sort to Admiral Collard in his cabin, that he would at once have lost his temper and probably threatened me with a court-martial for bringing complaints against a flag officer. Dewar spoke very highly of Daniel. He repeated the evidence he had given at the commander's court-martial, namely that when he had joined Royal Oak, he had found the ship outwardly efficient but dead. No enthusiasm and no life. In one month, Daniel had entirely changed the ship's spirit. He had implicit confidence in Daniel's ability and considered him the best executive officer he had ever met. And never had he met an officer whose morals and honour he would trust more. Now it was the prosecution's turn to cross-examine Dewar, as thoroughly as he had questioned his own admiral earlier on. It did not take long to get down to the heart of things. Prosecutor. Now... As regards the coming on board incident, what exactly did you complain of in the Admiral's conduct? Not saluting you or returning your salute? Dewar, I consider that for an officer to come on board in front of a large number of officers and men, with the captain and other officers standing at the salute, and for that officer to approach without returning the salute, without paying any attention to them whatsoever, is, to say the least of it, humiliating. Prosecutor, will you agree with me that of two men, one of whom behaves correctly and the other incorrectly, then the humiliation is not to the one who behaves correctly. Dewar. I don't agree with you under the circumstances. Prosecutor. Then we are to understand that the fact that your salute was not returned created this incident and humiliated you. Dewar. I don't agree I considered it an insult. Prosecutor. Was it not a very trivial incident? Dewar. That is a matter of opinion and I did not think it trivial. Changing the subject, Dewar was asked that if a captain of a ship had a very serious report made to him by his executive officer, was he to accept that report without verifying it? The accused answered that he should not. Well then, what steps had he taken to verify Daniel's report that the Admiral's conduct had a serious effect on discipline and morale in Royal Oak? Dewar's answer did not help his case at all. I did not meticulously examine every word of his letter, he said. To my mind, it helped me to explain to the Vice Admiral the result of these incidents. I thought it was obvious it would have a bad effect and I asked the commander if that was really his opinion. I felt I had to rely on the commander in this sort of matter. Then he added that he was quite ready to admit that a part of Daniel's letter might have been too expressive. Prosecutor. So, you forwarded this letter to the Vice Admiral making these insinuations against you and your own ship's company without examining every word. Dewa. I did not consider it my duty to alter the wording of a letter. I asked the commander if he was sure he wanted this letter forwarded. I do not think it is the duty of a captain to tinker with the phraseology of a letter submitted to him for passing on to a senior officer. Prosecutor. Is it really your view that you cannot censor a letter sent to you by a junior? Dewar. In a case like this, I consider the captain as either to forward the letter or not forward it. The words of the regulation are that he is to forward, in his discretion, such letters as he thinks best for the good of the service. Prosecutor. Where do you stop? 
Would you let any expression be used and sent forward? Juror. No, certainly not. Prosecutor. How far would you allow an officer to go? Juror. Would I consider it my duty to explain, secretly and in confidence, to a senior officer, the effect of certain incidents in a ship, and so long as the letter is limited to describing the effect of these incidents and does not contain unnecessary criticisms of a senior? I see no objection in forwarding it, providing the writer honestly believes what he has written. Prosecutor. How can you know, without going into the letter word by word, what is in the letter? Dewar. I did read the letter through, and I thought that it conveyed fairly accurate particulars which would help the Vice Admiral to appreciate the situation. Prosecutor. You have given a glowing account of Commander Daniel's service to you in Royal Oak. Dewar. Yes. Prosecutor. Did you not warn him of the risk he was running in putting such expressions into a letter? Dewar. I did not think for one moment that a letter of complaint sent forward in good faith would be turned around into a charge against the complainant. I looked in that letter as a secret letter and I was quite unable to tell the course of events which have followed it. Dewar was then asked what action, after all his years of service, he thought would ensue from sending on the letters. He answered that he had imagined that either one of two things would occur. He thought it likely that Collard would read the letters, then send for him and talk it over. Collard would admit that such situations as the letters described were intolerable and that the letters themselves would go no further. An even more likely outcome would be that Vice Admiral Kelly would send for both himself and Collard. Then Collard would be asked if the incidents were true, and that Collard would admit that, in substance, they were. By the time Dewey gave this last answer, the harsh, glowing overhead lights had been burning bright for some time, making the hollow, echoing hangar look an even bleaker place than it was by day. It had been yet another long day. At seven o'clock that evening, the court was adjourned. Chief Petty Officer Ryder Barrett must have laid down his shorthand pencil with a considerable sense of relief. It was a relief to know that tomorrow should see an end to these courts martial. At least the impatiently waiting fleet would be able to sail on its spring cruise and enjoy the much-delayed junketing, the balls, the shipboard dances, the fireworks and the festivities of all its ports of call in Spain and the south of France. But, in view of the most unseasonably nasty weather, the delay might have been opportune. The sky next day, Thursday, was no more promising. When the court reassembled at 9.30 in the morning, Eagle's immaculately spread deck awnings were snapping and cracking in half a gale, and sheets of rain came slanting down. The proceedings started in singular and unorthodox fashion. Quite out of turn, Dewar stood up and made a speech. Before this case reopens, he said, I would like to submit to the court that the defence wish to cut this case as short as possible, and they intend to cut down the witnesses to the very minimum, and they intend to limit the questions to the minimum necessary to prove the facts set out in the letter and hope that this will not be regarded as any admission of weakness in the evidence, because it is based on the belief that there can be no serious doubt as to the facts set out in that letter. In making this proposal, the defence hope that the prosecution will reciprocate and will, as far as possible, limit their questions to prove the actual charges set forth in the charge sheet. Rear Admiral William Boyle, the prosecutor, did not rise to this bait. He wisely said nothing in reply and waited to resume his cross-examination of the captain. Boyle's first question was to refer Dewar to his answer the night before. In view of your previous experience with Admiral Collard, did you hope he would do anything rather than take the letter to the Vice Admiral? Dewar replied. I thought it quite possible he would discuss it with me first. In fact, I was almost certain he would. Prosecutor. You make a definite statement. A great deal of discontent on the lower deck. And I ask you, if you will agree, that it is exaggerated. Dewar. No, I will not. But I don't for one minute pretend that it had produced anything in the manner that would lead to any manifestation, any definite action. I don't pretend that for one minute. Prosecutor. Will you agree that is a somewhat unusual and alarming state of affairs in a British battleship? Dewar. It is not intended to be alarming at all. I intended to convey secretly my opinion to the Vice Admiral of the effect of these incidents on the ship. Prosecutor. Would you agree with me that... If this was reported as a state of affairs existing, it would call for immediate action by higher authority. Dewar. That is a matter of opinion. Personally, if it had been a case of that sort referred to me, my immediate action would have been to send for the officers concerned and inquire of them. The prosecution then warmed to its task of giving the accused a rough time of it. Despite his protest that it had nothing to do with the charge, he was forced to confess he had taken no action to alleviate the lower deck discontent that he alleged existed. Prosecutor, in paragraph 11 of your letter, you state that in future the ship would be your first consideration. 
What had been your first consideration up to that time? Dewar. What I meant by that was that, if, on any future occasion, similar incidents occurred, my desire to avoid any scandal affecting the flag officer would be overridden by the necessity of considering the interests of the ship and of the service as a whole, irrespective of any individual. The prosecution made strenuous efforts to establish that Dewar had colluded in the contents of his commander's letter. How much discussion had taken place between them before it was written? Why had the commander shown his captain a draft of the letter before it was written? Was Dewar in the habit of receiving letters from subordinate officers in draft form? The accused could only answer that it had been a novel experience for him. He had never asked for a letter before. Prosecutor. Now what is the object of showing anyone letters in a draft form? Dewar. Presumably to see whether they approve it. Prosecutor. So that they then can review it? Dewar. Perhaps it would save time if I just tell you... Prosecutor. I don't think it would, really. Dewar. Commander Daniel's letter consisted of two parts. The second part contained remarks on a subject which I suggested he should make to me, and he brought those remarks to me, and showed them to me. I looked through them and said words to the effect. Now, are you sure you want these remarks to go in? And he said... Yes. There is no mystery about this letter. In accepting Daniel's letter, and will you please note that the word accept is used in both charges against me, I am supposed to have approved generally of what was in it. Prosecutor. Did you, or did you not consider that it represented the general state of affairs existing on board? Dewar. I considered it represented, in somewhat expressive form, the state of affairs which I thought extremely probable. But if I had thought it was going to anyone else but the Rear Admiral and the Vice Admiral, in a privileged form, it would have been altered. Prosecutor. Might I ask if expressive form means exaggerated form? Dewar. Not necessarily. It means some people express things in different ways. Now, Admiral Boyle pressed home the point he had always been determined to make, that Daniel's letter was a conspiracy between the flagship's captain and commander against their rear admiral. Will you allow, he asked, that in reality, Commander Daniel's letter was your letter? Dewar was adamant. I will allow nothing of the sort. Why should I? It was a separate letter signed by him. Why had Dewar's secretary had to retype his own letter twice? What alterations had been made? Dewar said he could not remember. But, he added, I can tell you that if I write an important letter on some particular subject, I may write as many as 20 drafts, and the fact that this letter was only typed twice is not extraordinary. Prosecutor. Let me quote the last few lines of Commander Daniel's letter. My recent appeal to look forward to the coming inspection, thereby making it serve a useful purpose for the efficiency of the service, has been reversed by the anticipation of indicted fault-finding. Do you consider that was a proper thing to add in a letter of reasons of writing for the Admiral to see? Dewar. I tried to explain this letter consisted of two parts. In paragraph 9, Commander Daniel says, This ends my report. The second part of this letter is not reasons of writing. I have said that at least half a dozen times. Dewar then set about the extremely difficult task of trying to convince the court that Daniel's letter had not accused Collard of being vindictive or even that Daniel thought that he would, be, he would be when the forthcoming inspection took place. Merely that the ship's company thought that he would be. He certainly did not convince Rear Admiral Boyle for the prosecution. Dewar went so far as to say that if Daniel had accused Collard of any intention of fault funding, then he would have corrected him. By saying that, he once more opened the door to attack. Boyle did you feel you were bound to forward this letter to the Rear Admiral? Dewar. I did. It was a matter within my discretion as laid down in Article 9. Boyle. If it was in your discretion, you were not bound to do it. Dewar. My discretion decided I was bound to do it. Boyle. Would not it have been more kind and considerate to have made your complaint without dragging Daniel into it? Now Dewar made his great confession. In answer to that question he said, I asked Commander Daniel if he was sure he wanted his letter forwarded, and he said he did. But if I had thought for one moment this letter was going to be turned around into a charge, I assure you Commander Daniel's letter would not have gone in. By such a reply, Dewar underlined in the most startling fashion how he had misread Collard's hot-tempered nature right from the moment he had become his flag captain. Whatever Collard was, he was most certainly not the man to knuckle down to threats. Any young midshipman with the least understanding of human nature would have placed a large bet or as large as gunroom pay would permit, on that. Automatically, Collard would have done exactly what he did do when the letters were thumped on his desk by Dewar. After a few hours of reflection, he flew into a rage of self-justification 
and headed for higher authority. Boyle was not going to let Dewar off the hook after his last admission, he asked. Then, in the light of subsequent evidence, it is your opinion that it was ill-advised to have forwarded Commander Daniel's letter. Dewar. I don't say ill-advised. I am certainly extremely sorry I did. Boyle was now on the rampage. He made Dewar admit he had not consulted any other flag officer in the Mediterranean fleet about the situation aboard Royal Oak, nor had he sought the advice of fellow captains, even though he was in the habit of going for long walks ashore with them. In fairness to himself, Dewar made it clear that he felt it would be improper to discuss Collard behind his back, and that on one occasion he had thought of approaching Vice Admiral Kelly, but rejected the idea for the same reason. Boyle. Is it a fair statement of the salient points in your letter, and that of Commander Daniel, as they would appear in it to an administrative authority? 1. The Admiral and the Captain were at loggerheads. 2. The Commander was in support of the Captain. 3. The officers were deeply indignant and resentful. 4. There was great discontent on the lower deck. 5. That a very serious effect had been produced on discipline and morale. 6. The ship was discouraged. Before you answer, I'd point out the last four are all definite statements. Dewar's reply was tart. In view of the fact that the administrative authority apparently read that I had entered into some sort of a plot or conspiracy to get rid of Admiral Collard, I am not prepared to say what view they would have taken of my letter. Boyle. Do you consider it would have been possible for the Commander-in-Chief, after receiving your letter and that of Commander Daniel, to leave Commander Daniel, yourself, and Admiral Collard in the same ship? The court intervened to save Daniel from answering what was, after all, a hypothetical question concerning the Commander-in-Chief. Boyle tried again. What I wish to ask the accused, he said, rephrasing his question, was if he considered it in the best interest of the service to leave Commander Daniel himself and Admiral Collard in the same ship after the incidents had occurred. Dewar. Well, my reply to that is that question is a most misleading one. I didn't say that at the present moment there was a good deal of discontent on the lower deck, nor did I say there was intense indignation or disgust among officers. What I said was the attack on the bandmaster two months before had that effect. I didn't say when I sent in my letter, nor did I intend to convey the impression that the ship was in a state of latent mutiny, and that if something was not done, something would happen. You have twisted my words to mean something different from what I said. Both the prosecutor and accused were tiring by now and the cross-examination ended on a fractious note. Boyle, do you not agree with me that the bearing of the officer commanding has a great deal to do with the discipline of the ship? Dewar, what do you mean by bearing exactly? Boyle, I will explain. I would like to use words of poetry. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Will that explain it? Dewar, no, I am afraid it doesn't. Do you mean if I had gone about laughing it would have made a difference? Boyle, I think it would have made a lot of difference. I mean, if the situation had been faced and you had shown there was no need for any discontent on your behalf, there would have been no indiscipline on the ship of any sort. Dewar promptly appealed to the court for support. May I ask the court, to ex he exclaimed, whether it is relevant in this case to discuss what I should have done and whether, had my bearing been different, the discipline of the ship would not have been affected. The court gave it as its opinion that the questions were relevant, but, it added stiffly, those questions should be in a shorter form and less involved. Admiral Boyle, clearly nettled, asked if that ruling would also apply to the answers. He was told that it would. With that, Boyle suddenly declared that the prosecution had no more questions to ask. Kimball then rose to re-examine. Are there any charges against you about your own letter? was one of the questions he asked Dewar. The accused replied, No, I wrote an official letter to the Admiralty begging them that I might be tried for writing it and forwarding an unjustifiable letter of complaint. The reply of the Admiralty was that they did not see their way to add that to my charges. I wish to clear my character from the imputation of forwarding or writing an unjustifiable complaint. Daniel took Dewar's place as witness. Today he was wearing his sword again. His punishment was still to be ratified by the Admiralty. When that happened, as it most surely would, he would be stranded ashore on half pay until, and if ever, it was decided to offer him a fresh appointment. But, until that ratification of his sentence, he was still attached to the depot ship HMS Cormorant. Boyle, in cross-examination, wanted to know why Daniel had not done more to check the wardroom gossip over Collard's behaviour at the dance and the ensuing incidents. He quoted one of the Navy idols, Admiral of the Fleet Sir John Jervis, Earl of St. Vincent, and what he had to say about mutiny. I dread not the seamen. It is the indiscreet, licentious conversation of officers that produces all our ills. 
Daniel rallied well. I don't recognise that quotation, he retorted. But it is extremely appropriate. For licentious remarks of the officers in question were responsible for the state of affairs which prevailed. Referring to that state of affairs, he cited the example of one senior officer indignantly describing Collard's language at the dance by saying, he might just as well have called my wife a tart. Then on added, there was a feeling in the wardroom the like of which I have never experienced. For that reason, I felt that highly coloured language was necessary to convey an accurate picture to the captain. The Reverend Harry Golding, Royal Oaks chaplain, was also called to give evidence on Dewar's behalf. He said he had asked to see Collard because earlier in that day, he had been in his own cabin discussing the music for the forthcoming Sunday church service with the bandmaster, when Barnacle had broken down. He was in great distress over the language that the Admiral had used to him. I wished to explain to the Admiral, Golding told the court, what I was sure he had not understood, namely that he had insulted, very cruelly, someone not in a position to reply. Golding went on. Rear Admiral Collard told me there was very serious penalties inflicted on those who made accusations against flag officers. He said, I'll have you court-martialed. I said, do you really wish to send for the captain, because I came to ask your advice and also to prevent mischief, not to make further mischief? I explained that, in the minds of a number of people, he had insulted someone in the presence of ladies very cruelly, and he was not in a position to reply. In answer to Kimball, who asked if Collard had sent for the captain, the chaplain replied, He made a dive for the bell on his desk, but missed it. Golding, who must have had been either a very brave man or exceedingly rash in his bearding of the infuriated admiral, said that, after the incident of the bell, I asked him if he really wished to send for the captain as I was dealing with facts well authenticated. Kimball. What was his condition? Golding. In the greater part of the interview, he was out of control. I had the greatest difficulty myself in remaining in the cabin. Golding stated that a number of men of various ranks had been to see him and ex had expressed higher indignation with what they thought had been an abuse of power. I don't think, he said, that anyone expressed a complaint about the actual term used. That was more or less a technical matter. As for the wardroom officers, the chaplain said they were furious. I heard, he told the court, the admiral alluded to in very offensive ways, so I was obliged to stop it. I heard him called a bloody little swine. Boyle now had his turn for prosecution. He decided to deal with the matter of the word bugger. What do you mean, he asked Golding, about the term used being a technical matter. Golding. Well, it is very common in conversation. Boyle. Yes, it is used rather more frequently at sea than among the community of men and women ashore. Golding. Well, it is used almost exclusively, I believe, among men. Boyle. Would it surprise you very much to know that some of Royal Oak's petty officers first learned that there was trouble in their ship from the London papers? Golding. I know that it is so. Now the court took a hand. The President asked, Are the men in Royal Oak discontented now? Golding. They are feeling this very deeply. There are very evident signs, but they are behaving very sensibly about it. They are a very sensible ship's company. It was time for luncheon. The board members retired to their mahogany table in the flag officer's day cabin. The accused, his lawyer, witnesses, press and spectators, stepped out on a own sake deck to face the Levant. The local wind now blowing at full force and blushing the clouds down from the rock itself. When everyone had returned to the temporary courtroom, some having fared better than others, Commander Brownlow, Royal Oaks navigating commander and senior officer under Dewar was called. He said that his captain had told him more than once to try to anticipate Collard's wishes and intentions. He still believed that Daniel's letter was a fair statement of the feeling of the mess at the time. Boyle. Was the feeling really so high? Brownlow. Mine was so high that I couldn't even discuss the matter. There were other witnesses, including the redoubtable Major Atwood, Royal Marines, who made it clear that he bitterly resented Collard's slur on his corps. Then the defence's case was almost at an end. All that was left was for the final address, and Dewar was determined to make that himself. He was not going to leave his career in the hands of Kimball. But it was Kimball who asked for a two hours recess so that Dewar could prepare himself. This was granted, and on a soggy, dismal, Maundy Thursday, the court once more retired to kick its heels. But its members were better off than the spectators, including Mrs. Dewar and Mrs. Daniel. They had nothing but the chill walls of the aircraft hangar to look at. No one expected a brief final speech from Captain Dewar, nor did they get one. As he had explained earlier, he was a man given to drafting any statement that he made with patience and considerable care. 
It would not have been in the least surprising if he'd been planning his final address to the court, even before leaving England. Yet, for all its length, it was far from long drawn out or boring. One well-known counsel, after reading a verbatim report of the speech, doubted if any civilian lawyer could have argued even half so well. Dewar, in his quietly modulated voice and retiring manner, attacked from his very first word, or almost his very first word. He opened by defiling the charges against him. In each of the two charges, he said, I am accused of an act to the prejudice of good order and naval discipline in that I accepted and forwarded a letter from Commander Daniel. In the first charge, it is stated that the terms of the letter were subversive of discipline and in the second charge, that the letter was contrary to Article 11 of the King's Regulations, in that it contained remarks and criticisms of the conduct or orders of my superior officer. I would first like to draw the attention of the court to the fact that words, the following words, are omitted from the charge, although they are an extract from Article 11, and in fact form an essential part of it, which may bring him into contempt. Dewar submitted that this was a most important point, that the vital qualifying sentence should have been so omitted from the charge. He pointed out that when Kimball, in his opening address, had declared that no one had been brought into contempt, the deputy judge advocate had made an extraordinary omission. He said, in effect, that it was not necessary to prove contempt because the words are not included in the charge. Now, sir, demanded Dewar of the President, what would you think if the police wished to convict a man with being on enclosed premises with intent to commit a felony, and, finding that they had not sufficient evidence of his intention, they framed an indictment charging him only with being on enclosed premises. I submit that these two cases are identical. What do you think the judge would do? What do you think the Court of Appeal would do? Learned counsel tells me that the omission from the charge of this vital qualifying sentence is quite sufficient to invalidate the whole charge. If I may, I'll read you a few lines from Lectures on Naval Law and Court Martial Procedure. On page 15, there is an essential principle in every charge before any court that can exist in the civilised world that the charge should be sufficiently specific to enable the accused to know what he is to answer, and to enable the court to know what they are called to inquire into. I am charged under Article 11 on a matter of forwarding a letter containing remarks and criticisms, but Article 11 does not say that. It says that no one shall make or pass criticisms or remarks on their superiors which tend to bring them into contempt. I submit to the court that the omission of this sentence is a most serious defect in the charge. Dewar told the court that the prosecution, in its eagerness to obtain a conviction, had overlooked an elementary principle of justice. Furthermore, in an effort to make a mountain out of a molehill, it had magnified one charge into two. After all, if Daniel's letter was subversive of discipline, it could only be so by being in contravention of Article 11. That was to say, because it contained criticisms or remarks on the conduct of his superior officer. If that is so, argued Dewar, then the first charge is contained in the second, and if the second charge fails, the first charge must also fail. It is an excellent thing for the prosecution to have two strings to its bow, but in this case it has provided only one arrow. Dewar went on to say that the question as to whether the forwarding of Daniel's letter was prejudicial to good, to good order and naval discipline must depend on the circumstances that led up to the remarks in that letter and the motives that inspired Dewar to forward it. He had described those circumstances in his own covering letter. Is that letter true or is it not? he demanded. Was there, as Rear Admiral Collard would have you believe, a malevolent conspiracy on the part of Commander Daniel and myself to drive him out of the ship? Dewar pointed out that a great deal of evidence had been given as to the facts in his own letter. He did not propose to go into them, for it would be a waste in the court's time, as they were obviously true, and that the court must know. Opposed to this mass of evidence, he said, we merely have the statement of Rear Admiral Collard, and it is highly significant that the prosecution has not produced one single witness in support of the Rear Admiral's account. The idea of a captain of my seniority trumping up a series of charges against his Admiral is, I submit, simply absurd. What could I hope to gain by such conduct?'